actually, this is uh, uh, session 22. Uh, thanks to you all. We have been doing pretty good. And uh, today we're going to present a case on pedunculated colon polyp. And uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Selvi, Roy, Sylvia, and my good friend, uh, Roger, uh, who will serve as panelists. Uh, Sriram was supposed to be here, but Sriram just texted me that uh, he had to, he had an urgency that he couldn't make it. So uh, I would like to thank and acknowledge the support of uh, Dr. John Strohlein, and Mr. Charles Butt and Hitchie B. And uh, special thanks to Angela. Actually, Angela worked very hard yesterday uh, to draw a lot of uh, concepts. Uh, she worked the whole day, actually. And then I would like to uh, share my sincere appreciation to my institution, uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, for allowing me to do this uh, session on Zoom. So we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to present one case of pedunculated polyp. And uh, as we go through the case, we will discuss and uh, Selvi will run the poll. And uh, after I finish the case, uh, my good friend Roy is going to present another case, uh, which is going to summarize everything that we have learned in the first case. So this is a, a patient that I've seen almost uh, maybe eight, nine years ago when I first joined MD Anderson. Uh, the story is this is a middle-aged man uh, who actually had a surgery at uh, MD Anderson for can kidney cancer. And, uh, and then he moved back to his uh, hometown. Uh, I think he will, I believe he lives somewhere in Oklahoma. And uh, he underwent a colonoscopy there and was found to have multiple large polyps in the ascending colon, uh, transverse colon, and splenic fracture, almost three or four big polyps, you know. And uh, the colonoscopist uh, felt that these were too big and too many uh, for safe and complete resection. And uh, he put a tattoo at the splenic flexure and suggested that or uh, recommended to the patient to undergo uh, subtotal colectomy. And uh, having been uh, seen at MD Anderson before, uh, he came back to us for a second opinion. And I'm going to present, I'm going to present one case, uh, one polyp that was the largest in the ascending colon. And there were several, uh, two or three more in the other segments of the colon. And uh, we'll discuss the first large polyp that I uh, tried to uh, resect. So as we go through this uh, polyp, uh, every polyp, you know, you want to do the, go through the steps, uh, one to six. You know, you want to evaluate the polyp, uh, you know, come up with a Paris classification, uh, maybe optical diagnosis, uh, then think about whether the polyp is at risk for bleeding. And uh, if it is, uh, what can you do to prevent bleeding? How do you resect? And once you resect, put a tattoo, and how do you retrieve the polyp? And what do you do when the pathology report comes back? We'll go through that sequence. So here is a polyp. Now, this is a polyp, as you can see, there's a tattoo here uh, in the ascending column. And uh, I would like, it's a big polyp, almost occluding uh, the lumen. Uh, not completely, but you can see that it is coming from left wall and going on to the right wall. So in order for us to get into uh, learning the concepts, okay, let's take the uh, poll first, uh, describe uh, the Paris classification of the uh, polyp. Is it a pedunculated polyp? Is it a sessile polyp? Is it a laterally spreading granular tumor or laterally spreading non-granular tumor? All right. Okay, almost 56% uh, uh, or 50% said pedunculated polyp. 13% uh, uh, picked up sessile. 
25% laterally spreading tumor granular type and 6% laterally spreading non-granular type. So. Raju. Yeah. Maybe we should uh, give the feedback that um, laterally spreading tumor, they have to be by definition a flat polyp because laterally spreading tumors are flat polyp larger than one centimeter. So in here, the polyp is uh, pedunculated. So there is no way we can uh, decide, there is no way that we can classify it to be a lateral spreading tumor, granular or non-granular, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay. That's, that's good, that's good, thank you. Uh, all right. So what I want to do is initially when I, you know, <laughs> the endoscopy report from outside said these are large cell polyps. And when I came here, I thought that, okay, it's a large cell polyp. So cell polyps are more difficult to cut than pedunculated polyps. So I want to take you all through this uh, classification. Uh, there are two types of uh, polyps, uh, protruding or pedunculate uh, polypoidal uh, polyps, non-protruding or non-polypoidal. Protruding are, if you think about like a mushroom uh, with a stalk that is pedunculated, a small stalk, semi-pedunculated, uh, no stalk is sessile. So pedunculated, semi-pedunculated, sessile. And when the uh, width is more than the height, like Roy suggested, uh, that is non polypoidal or non-protruding type of polyp. It could be superficial elevated. And if it is more than 10 millimeters in width uh, in the spread, uh, and if it is granular, it is called laterally spreading granular tumor. If it is smooth, it is called laterally spreading tumor of the non-granular type. And if it is just barely elevated or not elevated, it is uh, completely flat or 2B. And then if it is depressed, it is 2C. And the depression could be just alone or a little bit elevation, it is 2CA. So you, you, you learn this concept. And initially I thought it was a sessile polyp. Now sometimes you can be fooled. And so I was not sure, you know, we rotated the patient, as you can see, uh, this, uh, the colon is moving around with the rotation. Mm -hmm. And now you can see. So we have learned in the last uh, session the importance of rotating the patient and making the polyp non-dependent uh, so as to manage bleeding. If bleeding were to happen in a dependent position, you will not find the bleeding source because it is it pulls down into that portion. Another benefit of uh, rotating the patient is if you think it is a cell polyp, you're not sure uh, not a bad idea to rotate and uh, uh, let the polyp hang from the roof. And if it has a pedicle, it will show up nicely. So with this picture, now I want you to take the pole again. Is it a pedunculated polyp? Is it a sessal polyp? Is it a laterally spreading tumor granular type? Is it a laterally spreading tumor non-granular type? All right. So it's good that uh, uh, everybody picked up uh, a pedunculated polyp. Uh, one person picked up sessile, and maybe they want to play with me, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's go back. Again, because this Paris classification is very, very important. And you may be thinking that I'm like a school teacher here, but I think it is important to repeat. Uh, polypoidal or protruding, non-polypoidal or non-protruding. Polypoidal, like a mushroom, is with a stalk, is pedunculated. Small stalk, semi-pedunculated. No stalk, that is a cell. 
Non polypoidal is superficial elevated. If it is larger than 10 millimeters, it is called laterally spreading tumor. If it is granular or non granular, and then, then flat and depressed. So you want to get into this uh, habit of describing the Paris classification of every polyp you see in your endoscopy report. Raju? Yeah. Can you um, maybe go over the difference between 1S and 2A for the uh, audience? So 1S and 2A is, uh, is basically the height versus the width. Uh, if the width is uh, um, more than the height, uh, or people say if you put a biopsy forceps on top of uh, uh, the mucosa lining, and it is about the height of the biopsy forceps or less, it is called uh, a flat lesion. If it is more than that, it is called a sessile lesion. Let me ask uh, Selvi and uh, no, Sylvia and uh, and Roy to comment on this. How do they make the distinction between sessile and superficial elevated? I think that um, I would follow the definitions you have uh, uh, described. And um, I have learned from Roy that um, dynamic inspection is very important. So if we can differentiate easily between a flat and sessile, a large flat or sessile lesion, it's sometimes not so easy to differentiate between a small flat either, or, or a sessile polyp. And I would use air insufflation and desufflation uh, to better visualize the lesion and to appreciate whether the width is um, smaller uh, than the height or not. So uh, air insufflation and desufflation help a lot. All right, all right, thank you. All right, so when you see a, a lesion and you say it is a pedunculated polyp, then what do you do next? Uh, the next thing you should look at is the head of the polyp. And when you look at the head of the polyp, you're asking yourself, uh, are there any surface features to suggest cancer? Is, there a malignant, is it a malignant polyp or not? Uh, although it is possible, uh, although it is possible to have cancer underneath, but you always have to ask yourself, from the surface, is there a malignancy or not that is obvious to you? So as you can see here, we are looking at the surface. Uh, there is pretty symmetrical, you know, uh, whatever the fluffy uh, appearance is, it's all over and it is uniform. And there is no area that is worn out uh, or retracted, right? As you can see that. So from this appearance, do you think this head of the polyp has malignant features? So on the surface, is there cancer? It's not a question of whether there is cancer underneath the polyp because large polyps can have cancer underneath, but do the surface show cancer? So about 68% said no, and 30% said yes. So that's what uh, the poll shows. Uh, uh, these are the results here. All right. So I thought that uh, the polyp head did not show malignant features, but in order to make this uh, contrasting with what is it that uh, looks like cancer? So you, as you can see here, uh, this is again a pedunculated polyp. So that's the head. And as you look at it, the knobby appearance, right? And then the look at here in this area, it looks as if it's worn out, you know? And when you lose that uh, uh, fluffy appearance, and have a worn out appearance, almost like a tire that's worn out on one side. Uh, that should make you think that there may be a, a cancer or surface features suggestive of cancer. So Roy, do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, so uh, if we go back to the prior slides, uh, you also can look at the, the, uh, the polyp and say, okay, there's uh, a lot of uh, mucus on it. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, it's very likely is uh, uh, phyllis uh, uh, producing uh, a lot of mucus on the surface. Uh, so some of you uh, may think, well, uh, maybe it's cancer, maybe it's not. But uh, to be fair to uh, some of you who said that it could be, uh, we need to look at the surface more. Uh, and so then uh, we need to uh, wash the mucus. Uh, and uh, is it uh, very accurate when we predict it? What features uh, suggest that it could be malignant? I think the only feature here is that uh, the size of it is large. So a large size of more than one centimeter in pedunculated polyp in the uh, old literature suggests of a, perhaps a 10% chance. So that's uh, where it is. Um, now, the next question then is, if it's a malignant, uh, is it, uh, has it gone into the stalk? So then, uh, Raju had shown his uh, the first polyp and the stalk looks very thin. Uh, the stalk looks good. So likely it has gone to the stalk. When you go to the second polyp, you look at the stalk and you say, hmm, the stalk has uh, these three folds into it. What does that mean? That actually uh, suggests uh, that uh, the, the head is, uh, is malignant. Uh, the stalk is more thicker here, so you um, you become more concerned. Uh, maybe there is uh, already infection into the stock, and uh, I need to strategize my uh, resection so that I can get uh, the stock as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we talked about, you know, when you look at a polyp, you ask yourself, is it a pedunculated polyp? Uh, so the next step is, uh, we looked at the head uh, to uh, figure out. And then when you look at it, you look at the stock. So there are a few things you want to ask yourself when you look at the stock. One is uh, how thick is the stock? And uh, the question is, how do you measure it? And then you want to th think about how many vessels or a big vessel will be there in that stock. All right. So here is a large uh, stock. And uh, let us ask, uh, put up a poll. How do you measure the thickness of the stock? You may need to, yeah, thank you. So is it by visual impression, just a guesswork? Uh, or do you use a ruler? Uh, because there are rulers that are measuring devices that are available. Or do you use a snare? or do you use an injection needle? So majority felt that it is by visual impression, at least uh, close to uh, half of them. And another half felt that it is by using a snare. And then about 10% said it is by injection needle and none picked up the ruler. So, Roy, you want to comment on how do you measure the thickness of the stock? I just use a visual impression. Okay. So that's reasonable. I think uh, one way to do most of the time that I do is I take my biopsy forceps and take a picture by the biopsy forceps by the side. Uh, you know the size of the biopsy forceps. And then you think about how many multiple times is uh, that stock so that it gives you a rough estimate. And uh, if you look at, if you go back into the literature and see uh, how do you measure the thickness of the stock? You know, when I was a fellow, uh, I was uh, taught this basic way of uh, measuring the thickness of the stock. Uh, so basically you take the snare, right, to measure. And how do you use a snare to measure? So you snare is closed. And if you look at the plastic sheet, uh, the snare is all the way inside. And then what you do is you open the snare, so you get the snare out, and then close this slider slightly, pull it back, and then make sure that the tip 
of the snare is at the tip of the plastic sheet. And then you take a red marker and mark it on the uh, uh, on the handle here. All right. So this marker will be helpful. And this is how you could use this. So you take a polyp and you put a loop around. And as you can see here, the marker is here when you open and put it around. And that is the distance if you measure, you can be very accurate in figuring out the thickness of the stock. Uh, for most cases, it's not uh, really necessary, uh, but uh, you have to know, you know, what is the thickness and how much is it open uh, so that you could avoid certain mistakes. And the mistakes that ha can happen are, if your snare actually, you know, say for example, the polypores are a bend and then you put the snare and you're entrapping uh, another fold into that snare and then you try to close it, you should have expected this is where it should have closed, but instead it is closing here uh, long, uh, a lot more. That should make you think that, okay, maybe I'm, I'm trapping some mucosa and you have to think twice before you cut. Otherwise, you're going to create additional damage. So you may want to reopen it and readjust that. So something to keep in mind. So the next thing is we talked here is a very large thick stock. And uh, uh, thick stock uh, will be fed with a lot of blood supply. Uh, how many vessels do you expect in the stock? Like a tree trunk, one large a uh, vessel or multiple vessels uh, in the stock. All right. So about two thirds uh, felt that multiple vessels and a third uh, I felt that it could be just one large vessel like a like the main vein of the tree trunk. So, so this is a beautiful study that came out in uh, GI endoscopy in 2006. And what they did was they looked at the pedunculated polyps as well as uh, sessile polyps. And they looked at the polyp base or the polyp uh, stock, right? And this is uh, from two millimeters to 12 millimeters. And uh, they sectioned and then looked at the number of blood vessels. As you can see, uh, as the stock size increases, the number of blood vessels keep on increasing. So when you have a thick uh, pedicle, uh, you should expect multiple vessels and you should keep in mind how to really make sure that to, you cut the stock safely without ending up with a bleeding from a vessel that has not been coagulated as you cut it. So that is the concept you want to keep in mind. And when these vessels, when these uh, polyps with the large stocks uh, bleed from a larger vessel, you may be in uh, a lot of trouble. So there is some concept you have to keep in mind. So when you see a large polyp with a thick stock, you should be prepared to manage the bleeding or first take all the steps to prevent the bleeding. So uh, these are the vessels that are actually in the stock. And you may wonder why the, how did you figure it out? I'll, I'll uh, take you through this as we uh, go through the story and uh, show you uh, how we came up with this. So just for the visual impression, you need to remember thick stock will have multiple vessels. So for, because this uh, is going to be at high risk for bleeding, uh, we decided to inject some epi. And uh, for all large polyps, I try to inject into the head and into the base uh, to use this concept called epinephrine volume reduction, uh, hoping that it becomes smaller for my loop and my snare to go around uh, to achieve hemostasis. And uh, the next, because I was afraid that this is going to have multiple vessels, I decided to put a loop 
and I want to take you through how do you use a ligating loop or a poly loop. So, so these are all the diagrams actually uh, Angela drew yesterday. So this is the loop device, as you can see. There are basically two parts that you need to keep in mind. Uh, one is the sheet that encloses the loop. This is the plastic sheet. The next one is the slider. Uh, this is the one that allows you to deploy the loop. So there are two important portions that you keep in mind. And uh, uh, the movements are basically either you're pushing or pulling, basically two things. So this is a sheet. And as you push it out, it will enclose the loop inside. And when, it, when you actually uh, receive the device that is preloaded now, that is called the poly loop, I, the loop is already preloaded. It's open loop like this. And you push, it, uh, push the sheet forwards and close the loop. And then you insert it into the scope uh, with the loop enclosed. And once uh, you come out into the operating field, you pull the sheet back. Uh, gently to open the loop and th then you can put it around on the polyp head onto the stock. And uh, as you do this, you can move the sheet uh, forwards or backwards to open or close the loop. You are not doing anything to deploy the loop. So keep in mind that you could use the sheet movements to adjust uh, the closure or opening of the size of the loop. So adjust the sheet. That's the principle you want to keep in mind. As you move forwards, the sheet become the loop becomes smaller. And then when you're ready to deploy, then what you do is you slowly pull the sheet back and you also close the slider. And uh, that's what is going to tighten the loop with a metallic ring that comes out with a plastic ring in there. And then as you tighten it tight, 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 and then you open the hands to deploy. So these are the principles. So I hope you understand the principles. And it's very simple. And basically, you have a sheet that can adjust the size of the loop and the slider that allows you to uh, completely close and deploy the loop. So let us see how we do it here. So by hanging the polyp, it's very easy to get around that uh, head of the polyp and you want to go close to the base and you tighten, tighten, tighten till it uh, uh, forms a waist and then you reopen the slider uh, to deploy the loop. So there is data now to show that if you use a loop versus, uh, versus no loop in terms of rebleeding rate, there's a big difference. So loops do help to reduce the bleeding. So then we talk about uh, cutting the polyp. When you have a large head, you want to pick a large snare so that you can go around that polyp and then be able to cut it. So there is uh, some people use a cut current. Uh, I use a coagulation current. Uh, and then uh, you have to tighten it very much, uh, more tight than the loop. And then as you uh, cut, uh, you apply the current, you watch what is happening below uh, the snare. And as you can see, there's a, enough distance between the snare and the loop, at least five millimeters. And as you can see, I close, close, close tight. You see that? And then what I'm doing is I'm watching below how much of the coagulation is going to happen. We don't want the coagulation to go all the way down because the loop is going to fall off. So, and then tight, 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 and then cut. So you almost uh, are closing your snare uh, so tight that your ring finger and the thumb ring are almost touching each other. 
So the slider is almost to the back of the uh, thumb, uh, thumb ring. That's the most important thing. So we can watch it one more time to just get a feel of what you need to watch. Watch below the snail, what is happening, how much of current is going down. All right. So in this case, although there is a loop, I was a little bit afraid because of the thick stock of the polyp and I wanted to apply clips uh, as an additional mechanism because loops can loosen. And as you can see here, how many vessels are there? You see big vessels, these are not small vessels. And uh, I actually made an, uh, um, uh, counted the number of big vessels. There's one big vessel here one big vessel here, another big vessel here, another big vessel here, and there are some on the other side. So important to keep in mind that thick stocks have large uh, vessels and multiple vessels. So we ended up applying uh, uh, multiple clips uh, to have additional uh, security uh, to prevent delayed bleeding. So this patient is coming almost eight hours from our institution, you know, by his drive, you know. So you, you want to make sure that you have a good secure hemostasis. So what's the data on combination therapy? As you can see here, this is another randomized trial about 10 years ago. Uh, one is epi and the other one is clip, clip plus loop. As you can see, the bleeding risk is reduced. The need for transfusions is also reduced with combination therapy. So combination therapy is better. So finally, you want to retrieve the specimen. Uh, in this one, this polyp was just a uh, one fold above the IC valve. So I did not tattoo that uh, because I could uh, take pictures to show that the polyp was one centimeter, one, one fold above the IC valve. But if it is at least uh, a little bit higher, I would have tattooed. And once you remove the polyp, you want to make sure that you pin the stock and uh, send it for pathology. So this patient did not have any cancer. It was a tubular villus adenoma. But if the patient has cancer, uh, you want to see that uh, is more than one centimeter away uh, from the stock. And if there's no lymphatic or vascular invasion, you know that you've achieved uh, curative resection of this large pedunculated polyp. So why don't I stop here and we can have some questions. Uh, maybe I'll open it up and then I would want to ask uh, uh, Roy to take the next section. Professor Raj, comment, Sylvia? Yeah. Yes, may I ask a question? Um, would you use uh, Haggett classification in this case uh, or only if you have my signs of submucosal invasion. Would it be useful to apply a Haggett classification? As we know, um, for pedunculated polyps, uh, this classification um, suggests the level of uh, invasion. And according to the level of invasion, we can predict the risk of lymph node metastasis. Why don't you just for the sake of the group explain that? Uh, yes. Actually, the there is a beautiful <laughs> article in, uh, in CGH about how to assess a malignant polyp. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend everybody to read that article. Uh, yeah. It was published in CGH, I mean, Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Uh, it talks about uh, how, how much is the depth of uh, invasion, first is the depth of invasion. Some okay. people also look at whether there is uh, additional tumor budding and that they take into consideration. Uh, the distance between the, the distance between the cancer and the resection margin. And uh, in every case, the pathologist has to look for a vascular and lymphatic uh, invasion. So if you have a moderately differentiated cancer, uh, more than uh, 1,000 micrometers away from the resection margin, no lymphatic invasion, no vascular invasion. Exactly. Uh, that, yes. uh, you could say that you got a 
curative endoscopic resection. If the cancer has poorly differentiated features, it doesn't really matter. I think mm -hmm. that patient would end up needing surgery uh, because that's how people have recommended. Uh, the second one is uh, if there is lymphatic invasion or vascular invasion, again, you have to think about uh, sending the patient for surgery because there may be lymph node involvement. And finally, uh, if the margin is too close to the resection site. But having said that, every patient that you manage, you also have to look at surgical risk. And if the patient has multiple cardiovascular comorbidities, you have to really think, you know, what is the surgical risk and what is the expected lifespan uh, to really come up with a, a good uh, planning for that patient. So. Right. Yes. yes, sir. Any comments? No. Tell me, no. Dr. Graham. So, Raju, there was a question in the chat. Uh, Asmin was asking, what dilution of epinephrine do you use for volume reduction? Is it the usual one in 10,000, or do you use a different um, dilution? I use the one in 10,000. Yeah. One in 10,000, yes. Yeah. There's so, also a question about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. About pinning the stock. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Roy has answered that in the chat for whoever asked that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Roy, why didn't you talk can, about uh, it? It's very important. I think uh, uh, we'll discuss about the pinning later on. Okay. Uh, but it's easy. You just uh, use uh, pin needles and then uh, find a styrofoam from a used box or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you just like pin the head uh, and then uh, you write down on the pathology uh, request form saying, uh, please uh, 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 dissect this polypore, please cut it at two millimeter sections mm -hmm. uh, because uh, here the concern is that there is a malignancy and then you want them to serially cut the uh, polyp head uh, into two millimeter uh, right. pieces. Uh, slices and then uh, look at them and uh, if there was malignancy then uh, to make sure that there is no lymphovascular invasion. Mm -hmm. So Hassan has asked can you please comment on the selection of uh, cartery uh, settings uh, in this case, I basically used uh, uh, an Irby machine. That's what we have uh, at Anderson. Uh, and uh, I used a uh, force coagulation, 25 watts. That's what I used. Uh, if I use an endo cut uh, setting, uh, uh, then what I try to use is uh, effect three, uh, duration one. And then I would increase the interval to six or something like that, five or six. Uh, what is important it is you have to keep in mind there are two things. Uh, the amount of uh, uh, electrosurgery current you're using and also important is how do you close? And as you close, you want to watch what is happening below the snare. Uh, on the stock, you know, that's what I tried to show in that video. And you want to make sure that you get some whitening, but the whitening doesn't go all the way deep uh, to the bottom of the stock. So you have to close it in such a way that uh, you can get the cut, but enough coagulation to seal off the blood vessels. Uh, you have to keep in mind that electrical, uh, electrosurgery damage uh, what you see is not what you get in the tissue. You know, if you see two millimeters uh, of uh, cautery effect as whitening, uh, there is a lot more heat damage and that you don't see that has gone even beyond that. So something to keep in mind. So... All right. So the reason I put this photograph here is I like that uh, cross on St. Luke's. It's a beautiful 
uh, uh, photo uh, to look at the cross and everything together. So, all right, uh, Roy, I'm going to take you through the uh, slides. Hi, good morning, everyone, or good evening. Uh, thank you, Raju, very much. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, share with you a case that uh, Tonya and I did together about a week or so ago. And uh, the idea here is that we wanted to transfer what uh, was uh, going on in our mind as we were doing the case. And uh, hopefully then uh, we can transfer all of the knowledge base to you. Okay, next slide. And the polyp uh, came to us uh, referred uh, after somebody had performed a CT uh, colonography uh, and uh, found a large uh, lesion in a very uh, uh, sick patient. And uh, uh, there's the lesion. Uh, it's uh, concerning that there are uh, these areas that uh, Raju had uh, coined this term like a an old uh, used rubber, uh, an old used tire in the center. Uh, but it's also concerning because uh, the appearance of it uh, is very different than what Raju's uh, uh, first case. Uh, so there's like a more of a sudden nodule at the six o'clock direction of the polyp. Uh, and you know, the, you had expected that this polyp would be a hemisphere, right? Why would there be a nodule at the tip of it? Just like a, almost like a nipple like there. And all of those, these findings of like what we call as uh, irregularity on the surface, uh, those are concerning findings for malignancy. So uh, in the first uh, second, you would, we, we were thinking this is uh, most likely a malignant polyp. The question is that, uh, could this be resected safely uh, by endoscopy? And that depends on the stock. Uh, the stock has these three folds. Uh, we call that as converging folds. Uh, those converging folds are uh, one of the signs of uh, malignancy. And uh, we, uh, at this point, would want to know more about the, the stock. Next. Uh, and. Uh, the, the polyp uh, seems to be hanging uh, and uh, in the initial picture, the picture on the left, uh, but we really cannot tell that until uh, we uh, put the polyp at a six o'clock position. So uh, when you put the polyp at a six o'clock position, uh, the issue of hanging or not uh, will be uh, determined. This is a, uh, we needed more images uh, to explain this, but uh, let's just think it this way. The polyps head is the heavy part and that part uh, needs to be like standing up like a, like, like a tree, like these are the top of the tree. And there is no polyp that's standing up while it is on the dependent position. There is no way based on the uh, law of gravity that the polyp can be standing up. It doesn't have, the stock doesn't have the strength. So uh, when you put the polyp at uh, the stock at the six o'clock and it's like laying down like this, you know that this polyp is in the dependent position. Uh, and uh, then you start thinking, well, this is dependent position. This is more complex than I would like. The polyp that uh, Raju had uh, shown us uh, is, uh, the polyp uh, that is uh, standing up. And the reason why it's standing up is that it is hanging uh, from, the, uh, from the ceiling. Uh, so we need to figure it out uh, uh, as we look at this uh, stock and we say, well, the stock looks uh, kind of maybe soft. Uh, yeah, it has these uh, three folds on it, uh, but it doesn't to look to be expensive. Uh, so uh, if there was a malignancy, it probably hasn't gone to the bottom of the stock. It's possible to be at the neck of the, of the stock. Okay, uh, so uh, we have some ideas. Now we are going to uh, investigate the baldy part of the head of the polyp. 
and uh, unfortunately, because of the positioning of the, the position of the polyp, we couldn't see and force the head, uh, the top of the head. Uh, but we saw enough here. So you had expected that this polyp would be somewhat roundish. And then here, the top is kind of like missing. It's become flat. Uh, and there's this uh, nodule on the left side. Uh, and you say, this is a nice classification type three, invasive pattern. Uh, we need to cut this uh, to uh, as much of the stock. Amorphous area, nice type three. Next. So we are done. Uh, that classification is uh, happened uh, within uh, maybe a couple of minutes in the beginning. Uh, we process uh, all of the information about uh, the characteristic of the polyp. Next, uh, Raju, move uh, the slide. So we here uh, also know that uh, uh, by the, having the polyp uh, sitting down or lying at the dependent position, it would be quite difficult to do it by uh, dragging the loop uh, and hopefully that the loop can slip underneath uh, the head of the polyp and then we can drag it to the bottom of the stalk. Uh, so the, you see the blood at nine o'clock position. Uh, you know, uh, if we were thinking, well, maybe we can uh, open the loop and then uh, drag it down there under the polyp, that ain't going to happen. That just, uh, in our experience, that just doesn't happen very easily. So uh, how do we make uh, something that's on the floors to be standing up? Well, uh, there are a few ways to do it. We can uh, change the position. Uh, the patient, however, uh, uh, is heavy. Uh, it would be hard for us uh, to uh, change his position. Um, and uh, number two, uh, we could uh, do water immersion. Number three, we could inject uh, the stock. Uh, I generally don't like to inject the stock uh, because uh, I know that I will be preventing bleeding using uh, the loop. And I, uh, I, I, I believe that the, the data of the uh, 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 epinephrine injection of the head or the, the stalk is actually not very robust in terms of the long-term data. Uh, we do not know that if you inject the, the stalk, for example, and it happened that the patient has a lymphovascular infection, whether you actually could dislodge the, the cancer cells and uh, make it uh, uh, spread to other um, organs. Uh, so we don't like that. And uh, so the, the, uh, the technique that we could perform at this time is really just water immersion. So uh, water immersion uh, will make the polyp to be floating. Uh, and then it will open up that space at uh, nine o'clock where the blood is so that we can uh, slip the uh, endo loop underneath the head of the polyp. Next, Raju. So here uh, we we just use the wat the water jet, immerse it, and uh, you can see more of uh, the destructed part of the head of the polyp. Uh, so whenever there is destruction of the uh, top layer of the mucosa, you know that there is a malignancy because all, only malignancy destroy. Uh, the layers. So you see that uh, on the smaller image, uh, the polyp is like uh, bobbing up and down, floating, and we can uh, then uh, slip the uh, endo loop uh, with ease. Uh, so here, uh, I don't have the series of pictures uh, to show uh, what Raju had described, which is uh, using the sheath uh, to close the loop first. Uh, many people would want to say, oh, okay, I'm just going to close the loop uh, using uh, pulling the handle. When you do that, the, the loop invariably will uh, fold up. The loop uh, is not like a snare that when you close that, it close in one, one plane. The loop will fold up and, uh, and it will cause a, a lot of difficulty uh, uh, in positioning it correctly. Thus, uh, 
almost always you need to uh, perform uh, closing using the sheath first. So you close the sheath. Uh, I have uh, sent you a, a, a video uh, description of how to close the sheath and then close the loop uh, simultaneously uh, because this uh, technique uh, you must actually uh, uh, try out with your team outside the patient. Uh, it requires some coordination um, of closing the sheath and the loop simultaneously. If you do not uh, perform the, the steps correctly, uh, there is a chance that the sheath actually cuts into the uh, the stock and uh, or uh, the the loop uh, will will just transect the polyp. So please uh, uh, don't do uh, this technique uh, on your first polyp, uh, but uh, rather uh, take time and understand the mechanics of it by. Uh, uh, performing the technique outside the patient. So your team fully understands on how to uh, perform endoscopic looping. Next. So the steps, uh, please look at the videos I had sent you. Uh, close the plastic, uh, simultaneously close the loop, uh, close plastic, close loop, uh, and you tighten. Uh, you tighten until uh, the polyp is uh, of different color. It looks ischemic, it looks pale. Uh, you actually spend a, uh, maybe at least uh, maybe 30 seconds to 60 seconds. You close a little bit, you wait, you close again until uh, it is really, really ischemic looking. Uh, and then you deploy the loop. So don't uh, be in a rush, uh, take your time uh, until uh, you see that there is a nice uh, tightening uh, at where the loop is uh, positioned. You see the, uh, that juncture, maybe Raj, you can uh, point it to, the, to them where the poly, uh, the poly loop is coming out. You see that that area is very tightened uh, and uh, now it is ready. Usually at this point uh, at your handle, uh, you feel it's very springy uh, and uh, uh, you could uh, mimic this by actually looping uh, your uh, finger. Uh, it won't cut it, don't worry. Uh, you can, you can uh, practice on it and you can feel like, what does it feel when I have the loop closed and my finger looks a little bit ischemic? What does, it, what does that uh, tactile sensation like? Uh, and your team need to know that uh, so that they can close it uh, properly. Uh, so we have uh, done the, the, uh, the looping here is, is perfect. Um, and uh, there have been uh, older studies uh, before that uh, studies, the uh, study that Raju mentioned that used the epinephrine. Uh, but in the older study, the risk of bleeding after a proper closure of a loop is really about zero. And the reason is that uh, uh, the vessels will become uh, coagulated uh, because the flows are uh, disrupted uh, or stopped uh, by the loop. Uh, and uh, whether the patient is on anticoagulation or uh, antiplatelet agents, whatever, uh, with the loop uh, stopping the vessels, uh, the blood flow completely, it will uh, make uh, the flow, uh, uh, in, will make the vessels to be fully clotted. Um, next. Okay, I, I, do, I, I don't have uh, the, the picture to show uh, the positioning, but the position of the snare is about five millimeter above the loop. And then uh, we close the snare to the hub. So uh, here is the principle of current density in practice. And this is uh, why uh, Raju uh, had put in the electrosurgery principle in the beginning. If you look at the diagram on A, that is the, the wrong way to close the snare. Because uh, 
uh, the snare uh, has an area within it that's larger than the area of the loop, which is at point B. And if you do something like that, like you say, okay, close your snare slowly, and then you cut with me. When you do that, there'll be no cutting at the snare position because the current density will be highest at point B. And you're going to be saying, oh, it's not cutting. Let's just uh, put more current and more current. And what you're doing is that you're burning more on point B and the, the heat may uh, uh, heat up the musculus propria underneath it and it could cause uh, coagulation necrosis. So what do you do? Uh, go back, Raju, to uh, the prior slides. You need to tell the, 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 uh, the assistant, close as, as to the hub. And uh, when you close to the hub, then the space uh, between uh, the area within the snare is smaller than the loop. And the cutting here will happen within a, a microsecond. Uh, then remember, you have put a loop there, so there will be no bleeding. So here is the resection uh, site. Uh, there are always uh, vessels uh, when the pulp is big, uh, and the reason is uh, shown in the diagram. Uh, I must tell you that that study from uh, 2006 uh, must have not been done correctly because every artery is accompanied by a, a, fas, a vein. So the minimum number of vessels, uh, large vessels in a pedunculate polyp has to be two. Uh, you cannot have an artery without a vein. Uh, but uh, that's a minor point. Uh, so there uh, you see the vessels, then that's why we had to uh, loop this patient. Uh, next. So uh, next, Raju, next slide. So here uh, we uh, wanted to uh, drive down the last uh, uh, point. Uh, we uh, had sprayed a little bit of indigo carmine uh, to uh, uh, make the point of the baldy part uh, and uh, to make the point of a depression. A depressed area cannot be appreciated using NBI. And that's why the dye-based uh, image enhanced endoscopy is always needed. Uh, depression is best seen when you have the dye pooling. And here uh, we were trying to uh, show the trainees. Uh, here is uh, why, the reason why you need to use Indigo. We didn't use it in this patient, but uh, uh, we uh, wanted to show it uh, also to you that uh, this is polyp has a depressed component. Uh, and that by definition, uh, is, uh, is where the cancer is. The pathology is an adenocarcinoma T1 limited to the head. So this is what Sylvia was mentioning. Uh, this is probably Haggett uh, 2. Okay, thank you. Beautifully done, Roy. Thank you so much. Yeah, beautiful case. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions. So there is a question. Can you actually cut a thin stock with the loop? Absolutely, yes. That's why uh, I have uh, uh, shared with you the Femio uh, to uh, uh, perhaps uh, help you and your team uh, to uh, really look at the mechanics so that you don't accidentally cut it. The question that uh, you should be asking is that, can you uh, do all of these maneuvers and still uh, cut a thin stock uh, polyp? Uh, usually not. Uh, usually you don't do that uh, in the colon, but if you have uh, an inflammatory long stock polyp in the stomach, uh, those polyps are very, very soft. And uh, this, this soft polyps uh, is very easily to be transected. So uh, be careful when you do it in uh, the inflammatory polyp in the stomach. So one of the things you want to keep in mind is 
if you have a pedunculated polyp and you look at the stock and you think it is uh, a very thick uh, uh, and you go for the loop. On the other hand, if it is not very thick, uh, some people, and including me, have tried using a clip. You could apply a clip at the base of the polyp. Uh, if the clip could go uh, almost across the uh, stock, you know, if you can go like that, uh, you can use the clip. Uh, so, or sometimes you may have to apply one clip here and the other clip here so that the multiple vessels that can't go through the uh, area uh, could be occluded by mechanical hemostasis. So, but on the other hand, when you are using a clip and you're using electrosurgery, uh, be careful that your uh, snare doesn't uh, touch the clip because then the current will go through the uh, clip into the base of the polyp. I think uh, you know we we talk a lot about uh, the setting of the cuts and all of these things. Here, uh, really, uh, what I wanted to emphasize to you because of the concept of current density, uh, our intention is not to coagulate the the surface. The bleeding, the prevention of bleeding, is already accomplished by the loop. If you had properly pro uh, put the loop on until it's ischemic there is really no, it's like a studies have shown that the risk of bleeding is zero. So uh, you can cut at any uh, super fast current. Uh, you can just use like a blunt, uh, a knife to cut it, uh, meaning like without current, uh, because uh, you're not really trying to like, oh, I need to coagulate it. I need to have this, all of this uh, perfect setting and all of these. No, none of that. You already put the loop and you're going to like just, just like guillotine it and be done with it. So here is actually the setting of the currents. In my mind, it really doesn't have any, any role in it. I fully agree with that concept. You know, I've, uh, I was telling the story as it happened uh, because we do learn as we go along. Uh, if I see a large polyp, thick pedunculated polyp, and I caused ischemia by putting a loop tight at the base. Uh, today, if I see the same uh, palette, I would use a cut to current, uh, cut to cut it. I just wanted to uh, make it clear. It's also good to share the case as you see, uh, because knowledge changes as we go along. Uh, there's another important uh, question that uh, uh, ML, uh, my good friend asked, if you're concerned with cancer diagnosis in the polyp, do you inject either the head or the stock? Uh, I don't. Uh, if I think there is a cancer, I don't do that. Uh, there is a, a good paper that came out uh, in gastro uh, from uh, Oxford, actually. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, they talk about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, spreading cancer cells when you biopsy a cancer and with the same biopsy forceps, you take additional biopsies from other segments of the colon. So I, I want uh, everybody to read that paper uh, about the possibility of transferring cancer cells uh, when you biopsy a lesion and, and do additional biopsies. So when there is cancer, I don't inject. I think it's a good point to talk about. And uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is uh, when you have cancer, your injection probably is not going to make any difference because cancer is packed with cells and packed with a lot of desmoplastic change where uh, any amount of vasospasm is not going to make that polyp uh, smaller. So from a, from a physiology point of view, it will not work. From a clinical point of view, you're going to make, uh, cause more harm to the patient. I think uh, both of us uh, didn't uh, show the last step uh, in inside the colon, which is uh, we uh, tattooed the area. At, at least I tattooed the area uh, because of, uh, you know, in this patient surgery is very prohibitive, but 
in other patients uh, if surgery could be necessary if there is a, a, a more advanced stage into the invasion. So you would want to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Kanwar Preet uh, uh, and asked, can you accidentally cut a thin stalk? And the answer is yes. Uh, do we use, do we only use the loop for thick stocks? And the answer is yes. I think uh, you have to uh, keep that thing in mind. You know, if the stock is thin enough, uh, maybe five millimeters, less than uh, in a two, three millimeters, is probably not necessary. Those lesions, you could just manage by a little bit of AP into the base if you're worried and, uh, and uh, use uh, current coagulation current to cut it. Uh, I'm just looking at uh, if there are any other questions. All right. Let's I think a, a last comment that I wanted to emphasize uh, everyone is that uh, the use of the endo loop uh, is very difficult to do if you uh, uh, do it, uh, do your first loop in a patient. Um, you need to say, okay, I have this patient or you need to say, I need to prepare my unit so that they can uh, perform endoscopic looping. And that requires uh, deliberate practice uh, uh, to do it. So everyone needs to say, okay, let's uh, go learn how to do this looping. Uh, you know, uh, here is a, a video instruction of it that uh, shows the detail. It even tells you like, uh, the model that you can use uh, to, uh, it's just like a pencil basically uh, that you say, okay, I, we need to have the team to learn how to close this plastic and then how to uh, deploy the loop uh, as uh, using the plastic coming back and then uh, closing the loop and so on. Uh, that part uh, you must uh, practice with your team. Uh, if you do it uh, for the first time in a patient, I can imagine uh, the, the difficulty of doing that. So Emil asked, uh, you know, how many loop procedures does it take for an assistant to become proficient? What frequency per week or month? Uh, what I suggest is ML, you know, every time, I, you know, it's not that common that we use loop. Uh, uh, it's not that common, right? We probably use it depending upon the type of practice, maybe once in a few weeks or a few months. So what I do is, if I think there's a pedunculated polyp, I need to use the loop. I basically go through the steps one more time with the assistant. And uh, I tell them not to uh, put their hands on the slider at all or the thumb ring and just play with the sheet. Uh, uh, using the sheet, you can open the loop, close the loop. You can do multiple times. You will never go wrong. And uh, uh, once you have the loop around the stock of the polyp uh, with the sh sheet, then I try to uh, play with the sheet to close the loop and uh, around the stock. And once I do that, I take over and I, uh, I do close the uh, sliding bar to deploy the loop. Uh, that portion I take over to do it so that there is less confusion. And as you do that, you could also uh, play with the sheet to make sure that the loop comes up. So basically I do a dry run outside and then inside the patient, I want the assistant to just uh, touch the sheet but not handle the slider at all. Uh, that way you'll have less problems. Right. I uh, completely agree with Raju and I want to emphasize this again because there is a question like uh, how many, how frequent of looping do you need to do? Um, that number will never come to you. That, that your unit will never have that. So the only way you can uh, accomplish this is really by having this uh, simulation based training using the, what Raju described as a dry run. So you the, do the dry run uh, before, or you do the, the dry run as part of your uh, 
uh, unit quality improvement, whatever mechanism you have, you need to have to tell the team, okay, let's go learn how to use the loop. Uh, it, the learning cannot happen when you have the big polyp in front of you and you say, let's go the looping for the first time. Because that uh, is a recipe for having a loop that is not tight uh, and uh, that just won't work. So let's, uh, let us uh, all try to uh, start going away from this apprentice-based learning whereby we use our patients as our learning uh, mechanism. We need to uh, go away from that and we need to say, okay, let's go learn this before we have the patient. Let's simulate the situation and then, uh, then we all can perform this. Uh, techniques are uh, perfectly well. All right. I want to thank everyone uh, for uh, being part of this uh, uh, weekly session. And I want to thank Roy, uh, Selvi, Sylvia, uh, Roger, uh, Emil, and so many others who joined from all over the globe. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Dr. Graham. Uh, thank thanks you. to Dr. Stolein. Thank you. Hope you all have a Lord. nice evening. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.